Welcome to TVBS Meeting Room, where we tackle global issues with a view from Taiwan. I'm your host, Wen Chi Yu. Joining us today is my good friend, Dr. Jamie Metzl, a former White House National Security Council official and author of several books. When the COVID-19 pandemic started, Jamie was one of the earliest advocates for a thorough investigation into the COVID-19 origins in China, raising the possibility of a lab leak theory. But back then, it was brushed off by most scientists around the world. And more recently, from various U.S. intelligence reports, there is a growing recognition that it is not unlikely that the virus was indeed a leak accident in the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Uh, tomorrow, Jamie is going to be the lead witness at a hearing in Congress on COVID-19 origins. We're lucky to have him just before an important hearing. So welcome, Jamie. Thanks so much, Wenchi. Happy to be here. So the U.S. Energy Department's latest report revealed new intelligence that COVID-19 was possibly a lab leak rather than animal to human transmission. They also noted low confidence in this report. And then the U.S. government has also had other intelligence reports that had different conclusions. And then the U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan also said to the media that the origin of COVID-19 remains inconclusive. So what is going on where there are so many different voices from the U.S. government? Well, this is it's not that there's so many different voices. It's that we still don't know absolutely how this terrible pandemic began. And we are digging and trying to figure that out. And the primary reason that we don't know is that from day one, uh, China and the Chinese government have done everything possible to prevent the kind of, of investigation that is so, so urgently required. They've destroyed samples, hidden records, imprisoned brave Chinese citizen journalists like Zhang Zhan. They've gagged Chinese scientists. They've impeded and prevented inter international investigations. And so those of us on the outside, without that access, are trying to gather as much information uh, as possible as we can. And so uh, what we want our intelligence agencies to be doing is, is digging through the available evidence. It's a very big deal uh, that the Department of Energy has shifted its position from thinking it most likely comes from natural jump from animals to humans in the wild um, to a lab accident, which could be a jump from animals to humans in a, in a lab. Um, and when people think of the Department of Energy, I mean, some people think it's kind of like the, the electric company. Um, but DOE um, uh, oversees the 17 United States national labs. Uh, they're one of the largest employers of scientists in the world. The scientists who they do employ are some of the top scientists in the world in physics, chemistry, biology, uh, biotechnology. So th it's a very, very big deal. Uh, but the summary is we don't know with 100% certainty. Uh, we need to keep investigating uh, and until we know it's good and healthy to have this kind of open conversation and open debate. So um, I was wondering, right, since since you were the very first, uh, pretty much one of the first uh, to really openly question the origins of the COVID-19, even in 2020. And based on what uh, did you raise the question and wonder um, if that was a possible lab leak? Even back so, then. Yeah. So in the early days of January 2020, I, like everybody else, was just getting this basic information. And we started to be told it came from the market in, in Wuhan. It seemed reasonable that, based on yes. our past experience of SARS-1. And then on January 24th, 2020, uh, there was a paper in the British medical journal, The Lancet, which showed that uh, over a third of the early cases had nothing to do with the market. And so that was a, a relatively clear early indication that the market was very, very likely where the, the virus spread, but not where it originated. And additional information uh, mm -hmm. suggesting that the outbreak may have begun uh, maybe as early as October 2019 only make that, that, uh, that view even stronger. So then... I mean, I, what I do I mean, in my life, I'm just trying to learn things and dig and explore. And so I really just dove in and started looking at the evidence. And very quickly, there was a juxtaposition between what the data was showing me 
And what I was reading in the mainstream media and in the scientific uh, media, scientific press, and elsewhere. Well, where did you so get the data? Um, since most people really get, I mean, it's impossible to access yeah. China, right? So where did you get the data? So there were, there, in those early days, there were publications. I mean, this uh, January 24th Lancet paper was a Chinese submitted paper. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there was information. Um, and I had recently, I mean, you know this, Wenchi, not too long before the pandemic, I had, uh, it's a whole other story for another day, but I had been invited to give a talk in Wuhan. I had negotiated, I said, the only way I'll go is if I have guarantees of free speech. And then they, when they realized what I was going to say, they got all nervous. I remember that. Yeah, I remember men, that conference. Men in black came to my guest house and told me that they'd canceled my talk. And that's all up on my JamieMetzel.com right. blog. Um, but... Um, so I knew the average American um, was thinking, oh, Wuhan, bats, markets, this must be some backwater where a bunch of Chinese yokels are eating bats for dinner every night. And maybe sometimes they have pangolin kebabs. And I knew that Wuhan is an incredibly sophisticated, wealthy, highly educated city. I knew uh, that it's a center of biotechnology and virology research. I knew about the Wuhan Institute of Virology. and um, I had been deeply involved with the Chinese CRISPR babies story and as, was a member of the WHO Expert Advisory Committee on Human Genome Editing. And this felt it had the possibility to be a very similar story where there's a revolutionary technology where China has made a determination that it wants to leapfrog scientifically over the rest of the world uh, by very aggressively doing research. Uh, and, that, that, and, and so it started to see at least a very real possibility that that was what happened at the at in uh, in Wuhan and the more I started to dig uh the more uh, it wasn't that I proved that hypothesis uh, the more very real it seemed in in February I went to we had our meetings of the World Health Organization uh, committee on human genome editing and I had all of these these at least suspicions or concerns and I thought well I'm going to go to this meeting my colleagues are some of the most sophisticated scientists and government regulators and others in the world. And I'm just going to tell them, well, here's what I'm seeing. And I was kind of hoping they would say, no, this is crazy. You're totally wrong. Here's what you're missing. Mm. But privately, people were saying, you know, I have these suspicions too. And, and I just... So I came back to to New York. This was uh, late February. So these these are these include uh, experts and scientists uh, in the WHO. Uh, right? I'm not talking about employees of the WHO, but the way it works with our expert committee is uh, it's outside advisors from around the world who yes. are who are brought in as as part of it. right. Um, and so I came back to New York. It just seemed like a very real possibility. So I started writing. I started speaking about this very publicly on, and on social media. In April, um, I launched my website on, on uh, COVID origins, which is now printed out. I think it's like 100 pages long, but it started out shorter. And I just started saying, well, here's, here's what I'm seeing. What am I missing? Here's all the evidence. Here are all, here are all the links. Um, and it was a very lonely feeling because I just felt like I didn't know anybody else who was saying this. Everybody in the world pretty much seemed to somehow know it came from a market or from the wild. But as I tried to dig to see what evidence they were using, I couldn't really find any evidence other than it, it had happened this way in the past. But there have also been lab accidents in the past. And these kinds of ca technological capabilities in labs are relatively new. So you can't have a, a lab accident in the 14th century because there were no labs. So that that's basically how, how this is. And then over the last three years, I've been kind of digging doggedly. And again, I was first on my own. And then uh, a small number of us found each other and we started collaborating. And that became yeah. a group known as, quote unquote, the Paris group. I mean, it, it's, it's fascinating for me to watch you do this, right? Because you're not... A trained scientist or biologist and virologist. Um, so why does this matter so much to you? What are you hoping to find out? So when she, we've been friends for such a long time, you know this about my history. I'm the son of a refugee. My father and grandparents mm -hmm. came to the United States after the World War fleeing Nazism. 
I've been a lifelong campaigner for human rights and for human dignity. 20 million people, according to the economist estimates, are dead as a result of COVID-19. Mm -hmm. If we don't fearlessly examine what went wrong and learn the lessons and apply those lessons to building a safer future, the next time it could be a billion people dead. And I guarantee you that the people who live through that pandemic of a billion dead will look back at the historical record and say, did we do enough to learn the lessons this time? And I get that there are a lot of political sensitivities around this. I get that the last thing China wants to do is be open about uh, this uh, possibility of an accident that could have killed, uh, led to the deaths of, of 20 million people. Uh, but I, I feel deeply committed that we have to learn these lessons. And if transparency and accountability are a foundation of a safer future, there's no possible way to build that future on a foundation of lies and half-truths now. And I think everyone would agree, right? Um, if accountability of the Chinese government in particular um, is what a lot of people are looking for, but given the nature of the Chinese government, and if we may never get to the bottom of it, as you know, said by many scientists as well. So, so then what? Um, since it has become so politicized, so that is my question. Sort of this entire process almost has been has derailed a lot of the you know true intentions, which is good and um, really what we should be really focused on uh, but it seems to be so politicized these days so it, it is it is politicized it was politicized on day one when the chinese government began suppressing brave chinese whistleblowers on day one and why do you started. think they they did that this is my fundamental question why did the chinese do that well i mean I think that anybody who who follows anything about Chinese politics know that the last thing the Chinese government is going to do is to say, hey, we're all about transparency and accountability. We want our local officials um, to be fully accountable and to speak to the public about what happened. If I had to just guess, this is a pure hypothesis, mm -hmm. um, but I'll, I'll say it it's again, purely speculative. My guess is the Chinese government was doing secret research, at, at probably at, at Wuhan Institute of Virology, maybe at, at the Wuhan CDC, um, with a well-intentioned goal. And that goal was uh, to develop perhaps vaccines and treatments for coronaviruses, including a pan-coronavirus vaccine, which we're still trying to create. I think there was probably some kind of accident. Um, mm -hmm. And like with all of these accidents, you don't know that it's happened um, right away because these viruses replicate quickly. But if the starting number is one person and then two and then four, uh, the numbers in the, in the beginning are very hard to track, especially during a, a flu season. So my guess is it probably took a little while to figure that out. And, and at that point, the local officials, as is kind of always the case in China, the local officials know that if there's a problem on their watch, they're going to get in trouble. And because most of these outbreaks fizzle out on their own, my guess is very quietly they tried to do that. And then at a later point, they, the national government was brought in uh, and then they had a choice when they when they realized what was happening. Either they could say, this is terrible. The local government has uh, covered things up. Um, we need transparency and accountability, and we're just going to admit it. We're going to let the World Health Organization in. We're going to do a full investigation. We're going to share everything we know with the international uh, international community. Like if they do that, what happens? The Chinese government falls in three minutes because the job of local officials is not transparency and accountability in the name of the public good. It's the opposite uh, of that. I mean, China. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So, so, so I think fundamentally yeah. you are, you know, pointing out um, the, the biggest, I think, um, challenge in the Chinese political system is truly transparency or a lack of um, and accountability, right? Because of how it's set up. Um, but I think, you know, um, what a lot of people 
especially back home in the U.S., a lot of people do not like is how uh, the Trump administration sort of, you know, politicized this issue and blamed the outbreak on China uh, during the presidential election cycle as a way to shed its own responsibility for its own poor response to this unprecedented public health crisis, too. So um, so I think, you know, this if this I could, if, I, if I could just jump in on that. I totally agree with that. I mean, as you know, Wenchi, I'm a progressive liberal Democrat. I was not a fan of, of President Trump. I questioned much of what he said. I absolutely questioned his motives. I absolutely think that these claims, which I didn't see any evidence of in the early in first, he uh, overly pl uh, praised Xi Jinping against the advice of his own government. And then when things started to go bad here, he abruptly um, switched course and started uh, blaming China. I didn't like any of that. But right. even as a, as a progressive Democrat, the last thing that I want to do is to s suspend my critical thinking and yep. just say, well, I'm going to condemn something because somebody I don't like said it, or I didn't like the way they said it. And so absolutely the trump administration politicized this topic but it could yeah. have been that even in this terrible crass inappropriate and even maybe at that time uninformed way they were accidentally right and so for me that's why i always say the politics here are irrelevant we need to understand what went wrong so we can address our greatest challenges. Yeah, I, I think, as you said, the politics is irrelevant. It's interesting because Matt Pottinger, uh, actually your co-author of a, a recent Wall Street Journal uh, opinion piece on the origins of COVID-19, was just in Taiwan and actually talked about, you know, the and openly question of the origin issues as well. On the other side, he actually said politics, you know, should be uh, uh, should should trump everything in terms of how we view and evaluate uh, the evidence. Um, and I think the problem with being this issue so politicized, uh, regardless of the intention, is that right now there is literally no uh, trust or confidence. It doesn't matter whether it's China's fault or the U.S. or the West fall. So what we're seeing is China is further shutting down the door to any possibility to international investigation, which is kind of... Yeah, but I would say, I would say, Wenchi, it's not further. It never had any intention to allow it. I mean, the strategy of China from the very beginning was to prevent an international investigation. That's why China slapped sanctions on Australia in early 2020 when... Scott Morrison um, had the gall to call for an investigation. They were trying to warn every other country. So I, I just think, I mean, yes, there's dangerous politicization, but that has nothing whatsoever to do with China's behavior. China was never going to allow an investigation. They began their cover up while, while President Trump was actually wildly and inappropriately, in my view, praising Xi Jinping. And so I do a view, I do view um, the, that it's we shouldn't overly politicize uh, this, uh, this process. But politics is at the core of what went wrong. It yeah. is the unique pathology of the Chinese state that is that underpins this entire pandemic, the cover up the silencing of the whistleblowers, the prevention of WHO uh, teams from going to Wuhan, the knowing lying uh, to the WHO and the international community about human to human spread. That was all Chinese internal politics based on the unique pathologies of the Chinese state. Yeah. Had those politics, had those, had those pathologies been different, I think it's very likely we wouldn't have the pandemic at all. Well, what about, um, I, I want to bring it back to the U.S., um, what about the growing anti-Asian hate um, that kind of, because of the anti-China hate that was also partially fed by uh, government policies and Trump's, of course, infamous uh, comments about Wuhan virus and clone flu. Um, of course, we know, you know, a lot of um, people, including you, even though you're advocating for investigation uh, into this origin, but 
you know, it's not a racist sort of behavior, but it has also been framed as a racist uh, approach. Um, how? What do you say to those people? Well, I'm against racism and bigotry in all its forms. I've spent my entire life fighting it. Um, obviously, I don't think it's racist um, to say that this pandemic may stem from a lab accident in Wuhan, followed by a criminal cover up by the, the Chinese government. And even the people who are saying it's racist, is it, um, as I mentioned, you know, my knowledge of, of Wuhan, is it not racist to say that these highly educated, sophisticated people who don't eat bats and pangolins, that, that they're <laughs> just kind of these barbarians who are just like eating, you know, junk from the forests. And that's why we have, it's not like that's so, so tolerant. And, and certainly the United States, you know, we, we have two histories. I mean, we have a, a history of, of, of intolerance, we have a history of slavery, the, the genocide, in my view, that was committed against uh, the Native American uh, populations. Uh, and there certainly is discrimination against various groups, African-Americans, Asians, Jews. Uh, but I would also say that the United States still today is, in my view, one of the most tolerant countries in the world. Um, and so I, I wouldn't want to overplay, but certainly incidents of intolerance against against pretty much all minority groups are up. And I, and I think what I attribute that is um, the, the kind of dog whistles that certain politicians like Donald Trump have, have made that have legitimated certain behaviors. But these are very fringe actions that we need to fight with everything that we've got and we need to fight them together. Uh, but I don't want to give the impression that the United States is some bastion of, of intolerance. And the United States is actually one of the most tolerant countries in the world. And we have a lot of work to do to fight the bad stuff and foster the good stuff. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, it also has been framed by China um, as a racist um, sort of way that the U.S. is putting the blame on China. So again, it's politicized for yeah. you know, obviously not justified. Now, setting aside the origin of the virus, um, China's zero COVID policy has been one of the most restrictive uh, reflecting again its own governance philosophy that leans toward control over individual freedom. Um, and on the other hand, interestingly, many thought the pursuit of individual freedom is actually a irresponsible behavior toward the greater community in combating uh, COVID-19 spread, which is kind of the belief in most parts of Asia, including Taiwan. So what lessons have we learned from the past three years? So first, what I'll say is no person and no country has a monopoly on truth, wisdom, knowledge, or, or anything. And so it, it makes me actually quite crazy when people say, well, our country did a better job or, or yours didn't. I mean, Taiwan actually, in my view, did a pretty great job, as did South Korea and New Zealand and others. And if we look at, at, at China in the early days of the pandemic, they actually did a pretty good job of protecting their populations. And I would never criticize a country for overly protecting its population um, from a, a deadly uh, pathogenic disease. So I, I actually would praise China. Uh, the problem with China is when they, the, the lockdowns in the early days, the goal was to buy time so they could do all of the other things that needed to be done vaccinate the, the population, build out mm -hmm. hospital capacity. And they so over invested in that first phase in building those quarantine centers and controlling everybody, that they actually didn't transition. And then um, as a result of just, uh, I will just use the stronger word, disgusting nationalism, rather than purchasing the foreign mRNA yeah. vaccines that actually worked. Um, they refused and in, first inoculated their uh, population with their far inferior uh, uh, Chinese, um, Chinese vaccines. And then even that didn't do a very good job of protecting the older people. So, the, so countries like New Zealand and others who kind of had a hard lockdown first and then transitioned, I think ultimately did better. And again, the lying is the hardest part. I'm not saying this even as an American. I mean, for Chinese people, 
so many of them, so many people who, who we know have lost relatives. Yeah. Uh, the, the estimates of the number of COVID dead just in this last round are, are around a million people. And so who benefits from these lies about the Chinese fatalities? I mean, maybe the Chinese government, but it's kind of equivalent to what's happening in the war in in Ukraine, where uh, the Russian government has drafted a bunch of, uh, of people from little villages. And if a few body bags come to each little village and nobody has, and they don't have an open media, no one can pull the story together. You can, for the government, you can keep, keep your tail going. And I think that's, it's calling for transparency and accountability it isn't some kind of propaganda tool for the United States or, or Cold War weapon. It's it's a way yeah. of I, I, all I of think, our futures, including the people of China. I think, interestingly, China's argument for a more restrictive zero policy actually, you know, made sense in the beginning, but yeah. um, it did not make any sense. Um, that they bought all the time not to vaccinate their people properly. And when they opened up, it was almost just all of a sudden, so many more people died. Um, it was almost like the lockdown wasn't for anything. It wasn't even yes. worthwhile, just yes. lost time. I so agree. And, we, and, and I just one, one quick thing. And I would, I mean, I think the United States did actually a terrible job. I mean, I'm not saying all of this to praise the United States. I think that our, our testing was bad. We were uncoordinated. Our messaging was, was chaotic. So it's not like I'm just saying, oh, America's perfect and let's criticize China. I'm happy to criticize the United States, anybody. Our goal should, our question should be, what's the highest standard that we want as, as citizens of countries and as, as people living in, in, in a world? And then how do we hold everybody, including ourselves and our own governments to those highest standards? Yeah, I think same same argument for Taiwan too, which was praised as a model country in responding to COVID. But you know, at the end, um, also the government got a lot of criticism from its own citizens. So the last question, since we have very limited time, is that um, you know you've been a steady critic of China's undemocratic political system, um, and increasingly we are seeing a world divided by camps of Western democracies, non democracies, and non elite alliance. Um, and, you know, I would say in the meantime, U.S. own domestic, you know, political messiness does not bode well for democracy promotion abroad. And Taiwan um, is kind of caught in between because while Taiwan is a longtime U.S. ally and a proud the admiration for the U.S. has also been declining. And so do you still believe um, speaking loudly about U.S. values is the best way to show its global leadership? And more importantly, has it been effective more recently? Yeah, so a, a few questions in, embedded in that. Um, certainly, as, as I said before, as someone who believes in human rights, I think we need to be critical of injustice wherever we see it, at home and abroad. And there is no doubt uh, that America is becoming increasingly divided and polarized. And anybody looking at the January 6th uh, riots uh, and attacks in the United States wouldn't say, oh, that's democracy at work. You would say like, geez, that's really frightening. I don't, I don't want that. And so the test of any government's gov uh, government um, and governance system is, does it deliver a better quality of life. I, cert I certainly believe that having the, serve the people better, really, yeah, to that's, serve that's the, people the standard. Better. And so I certainly believe that over time, uh, democratic structures do better than that. That's why I'm a firm believer in democracy. But I wouldn't claim to have a monopoly on knowledge like the, the Meiji Japanese in the, in the late 1860s and, and 1870s. We need to learn from where, wherever we can, we can learn to do better. And I think America can learn from China. China can learn from, uh, from America. You know, I, I, I like to push back on what you said about Taiwan in, in the middle, and I, I don't want to be um, inappropriate, um, but the people of Taiwan are asking the American people and the American taxpayers to risk lives, resources, uh, and uh, to protect your democracy, which we really believe in. But if the United States said, hey, Taiwan is, is, is on its own, that's a faraway interest. 
um, it would fundamentally change your politics. I, I don't. I don't think it's appropriate to say that uh, Taiwan is caught in the middle, like Taiwan is some kind of, of bystander. In my view, the United States and Taiwan believe in a set of principles for democracy, transparency, accountability, accountability, uh, the rights and responsibilities of of citizens. And so that's why, for me, the issue isn't. American values. If this is just American values, and America has something that's just American, and we're trying to force that on the rest of the, of the world, well, that's bound to fail. Because what are those values? That's just imperialism. If there are a set of values, which is what I believe uh, that the United States and our allies and partners believe in, and these uh, these principles underpin the United Nations and 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 the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, and we're working together to support those values, I think that's absolutely essential. So uh, I, I don't think that there is a thing, American values, because if there is, those aren't worth fighting for. What are worth fighting for is human values, democratic values, the principles of the United Nations Charter and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and the, United, the people of the United States, the people of Taiwan, and frankly, the actual people of China are all on the same side. So, um, Jamie, among many other things, you're also the chairperson of a great initiative, One Share World, um, obviously, uh, is to promote those ideas. So thank you for joining us today. Uh, good luck with the hearing tomorrow. I hope it will invite thoughtful questions to further public health governance, whether it's in China, the United States, or in the rest of the world. So take care. Thank you so much, Wenchi. If we, if we have time, I'd like to say one more thing. So as I as I told you before, I, I, as you know, I'm an Ironman triathlete, and I was visiting yes. Taiwan a number of years ago, and I went to Hualien, and I rented a bicycle, and I biked up, I mean, it must be 10,000 miles up this hill, uh, and I've never received more jayos than <laughs> every single car that passed me. Somebody yelled Jayo out the window. So I hope that if people are watching uh, my testimony tomorrow morning and you can watch it live stream, uh, that uh, you will be giving me Jayos. Jayos. I try to fight for transparency and accountability and a better future for everyone. Well, thank you for sure. All right. Well, thank you. That was great. Good. Uh, we're little, it was only two minutes over time.